enjoy the fellowship. Right now, get your Bibles out and let's open up to James chapter 4. As we go through a series titled Life Tools, we are being instructed by the Word of God with the tools we need to be equipped for successful living, for godly living, for abundant living, for life to the fullest. And I tell you, I am so thankful for the wisdom that is found in the Word of God. Um, Casey, is it possible to get that waterfall background that you had on that worship slide up here again? I was worshiping, uh, praising the Lord in song, and as I was, I was looking at that background that they had, and it was just amazing. Look at this background. Awe-inspiring. I mean, look at the amount of water pouring off that cliff. I don't know if that's Niagara Falls or where that is, but, but incredible, incredible. And you know what? The God who has all the wisdom to make millions of gallons flowing over that edge every single moment just simply for this purpose, to take your breath away so that you would be in awe of the glory of God. That you would be in awe of the glory of God. That same God wants to have intimacy with you. The title of the message this morning, Drawing Near to God. Drawing near to God. How is your intimacy with your Creator? Are you close? Are you intimate? Are you in a awe-inspiring, romantic relationship with your Creator? I'd like you to look at James chapter 4. We're going to start with just one verse. Uh, when I find it, verse 8, look at it with me, read it out loud with me, just the first part of the verse, read it out loud with me, are you ready? James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Let's read it one more time, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Two ways to be married, two ways, happily married or just married. Oh, when you are happily married. I've been married 31 years to my lovely wife. She is amazing. So thankful for her. Uh, I married up for sure. Uh, she is the sweetest, kindest, and she puts up with me. That's a lot. But I tell you what, two ways to be married. You can be married, living in the same house, going through the motions, or you can be in love. You can be close. You can be romantic. You can be intimate. You can be longing to do things together. Or you can be roommates. Sharing chores. No question about it. Which one is the better? Uh, we don't even have to discuss it. Oh, way more awe-inspiring. Way more life-giving. Way more abundant to be in love. To be in passion. To be where you can't keep your hands off each other. I love that kind of relationship with my wife. And here the most amazing thing, God says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Why? Because God himself, the one who made that waterfall that we were just looking at, that God desires a relationship with you. Blows my mind beyond comprehension. And the reality of it is, we are not that desirable. And we know it. And because we know it, we have a hard time believing that this amazing, perfect God would desire intimacy with us. But that is the mystery of the divine nature of God. James has been showing us that God is madly in love with us that he is the bridegroom, and he calls us his bride, and he wants this intimate relationship with us. The problem? Well, we're not so faithful. We have other loves. And I want to pick up kind of right in, the, in this point that James is making. He actually calls us adulteresses. Adulteresses? What is an adulteress? 
I know immediately we think of sexual sin, and rightfully so, because an adulteress is someone who cheats on her husband. An adulterer is someone who cheats on his wife. Yeah, who breaks that sacred bond of intimacy and love and goes a whoring after other things. And God calling us here adulteresses, not speaking of sexual sin, but of spiritual passions that are being broken for foolish lovers. And uh, we hear God's heart breaking as he reads this. Let's pick it up at verse 4. Let's try to grasp what James is pointing for us. He says, adulterers and adulteresses. And uh, I think we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, uh, adulterers shouldn't even be in there. In the Greek, there's just one word. It's, the, the, it's in the feminine tense. There is no masculine tense. It's just adulteresses. Uh, to make it uh, more palatable they, or, or more understandable, they put in adulterers, but it really takes away from the text. It's really adulteresses because he is the, the husband, we, the church is the bride. Adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Yeah, you're breaking the sacred relationship. You're cheating on God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world, we looked at that a couple weeks ago. That means loving the world's ideology, loving the world's ways. If we do that, we make ourselves an enemy of God. Not that God's an enemy of us. We make ourselves an enemy of God. Verse 5, Or do you think that the Scripture says in vain that the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit of God, who dwells in us, yearns jealously remarkable remarkable the holy spirit living inside of victor the holy spirit living inside of tony the holy spirit living inside of kara the holy spirit dwelling inside of amy oh what is he doing he's dwelling jealously oh i want you to choose me are you going to go after other lovers or are you are you going to seek me today And the Holy Spirit is dwelling jealously in this adulterous bride that he has. But look at verse 6. Praise the Lord for this verse. But he, God, gives more grace. Amazing. Do you realize what that is saying? As we go, often our adulteries and other loves, God in his grace says, I will give you grace and I will bring you back to me. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to those who humble themselves. Therefore, James says, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, double-minded. Double-minded right there is a word that James uses. Nowhere else is it in Scripture. It's a word that James actually made up. He took two words and put them together. If you were to translate it literally, it would say double-souled. It would say two-timer. It would say part of you is here and part of you is here. How could that possibly be? Because our affections have been misplaced. Therefore, he says, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Lord, may you give us understanding into this text as we begin to unpack it. Lord, may you help us to see and to grasp your great love for us. And Lord, your intent in this word to call us back to you as a virgin bride. Not enamored with all the trinkets of the world, but with eyes fixed and focused, a heart set on you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible tells us that our purpose in life is to be in fellowship with our Creator. To be in fellowship with the God who had something in mind when he created you. 
you did not just come into existence by random chance. No, you were well thought out. You were planned. You were orchestrated. Psalm 139 gives us exquisite detail of how God had different thoughts about you specifically when he created you. And he said, I'm going to give you an IQ that is here and uh, you'll be able to grasp and understand these kind of things. And I'm going to give you skills in this area. And I'm going to give you some talents that you could use and run on your own apart from me. And I'm going to give you some liabilities, some weakness where, where you're going to go, why is this going on in my life? And here's what I want you to know. You were created for me. And as you walk with me, all these things will make sense. And you'll use these things for my glory. I'll use your life in a powerful way. And your life will begin to make sense. It will be an abundant life lived out to the glory of God. That was his purpose. We read when he created Adam, when he created Eve. We, we see God's heart. We see God's purpose. Back in Genesis, we understand clearly God's intent. They walked and talked with God in the cool of the day. How many of you love that evening, that, that hour of evening, that cool? It's my favorite time of day. It's amazing. I have these, these vines in my backyard, and they blossom, and they let out this fragrance at the cool of the day. Just a certain time where they just drop down. It's, it's, it's romantic. It's an aphrodisiac. It's like, ah, oh, just puts a song in your heart, right? And we read that God's desire, I imagine the Garden of Eden, how glorious it was. We, we, God's desire in creating man, to have fellowship with him. But we know the story, that fellowship was broken by sin. And God coming in the form of a man, in the person of Jesus Christ, to redeem and to restore that relationship. And here we are, we're this broken vessel, marred by sin, that wants to run its own course apart from God, and yet God coming and buying us back to himself and calling us back and trying to woo us, trying to romance us, trying to call us by his Holy Spirit, which is jealously calling, saying, hey, have some intimacy with me. Think about me. Come back into him. Do you think the scripture says in vain that the spirit that dwells in us yearns jealously? Incredible. Incredible. And Jesus likened this relationship that he wants to have with us with a husband and a bride. We are in a courtship waiting to enter in into a consummated relationship with our creator. And the problem is, is not everyone understands God's purpose. Not everyone understands life's purpose. Jesus told a parable to help us understand this of ten virgins. Ten virgins, ten bridesmaids, if you will. Ten bridesmaids that were waiting to get married. And they were waiting for the bridegroom to come. But for some unknown reason, the bridegroom was delayed. And we read, Jesus tells a story, five of the brides, uh, bridesmaids, not bridesmaids, uh, five of the brides, they got distracted with all the things of life, and they forgot that they were brides. They forgot that they were all about being in this relationship with the groom, and they got sidetracked with other things. The other five, oh, they stayed ready. They kept their eyes open. They kept the oil burning in their lamps, the Spirit of God leading them, and they were ready when their bridegroom when Jesus Christ came. Yeah, that is the purpose. All that to say that some people miss out on the purpose of life and never enter into this relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Some people miss out on that. And I want you to know something. Life is a courtship. To enter in into a relationship with God, with our Creator. The purpose of this life is to learn and experience who God is. To grow in his love and in his grace and in his person. To learn his perfect nature and his incredible love for us. That is the purpose of this life. 
And I tell you what, our eternity hangs in the balances. Think of that. Our eternity hangs in the balance on what we do in this life. Will we enter into a relationship with the lover of our soul? Or will we spurn him, deny him, and go after other lovers? Eternity hangs in the balances. Not because salvation is something of merit, but because faith without works is dead. If we don't respond to his love, then we have never received his love. And so this is the dilemma. This is what James is trying to communicate to us. Hey, we have this God who loves us, who is wanting to work in our life, who wants to transform us with his love, with his grace, and with his mercy. He wants to give us his word to illuminate our path, to show us who we were called to be and how we are called to walk that we might be in a close relationship with him. That is his purpose. He gives us his Holy Spirit dwelling in us to lead, guide, and direct us in our steps. And we are to be on that path. He's speaking to our hearts. But the problem that James brings up is that we are unfaithful lovers of Jesus. That's what he means when he calls us adulterers. We are unfaithful lovers to Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it means that our heart is duplicitous. It's sometimes wanting God. It's sometimes wanting the things of this world. We're unfaithful lovers. Prone to wander after other loves, after other passions. We are two-timers. We think we can be a friend of the world and a friend of God. And we learn, James taught us, no, it doesn't work that way. If you're a friend of the world, if you're loving the world's ideology, then you're now making yourself an enemy to God. You're going against God's ways. You're breaking your relationship. And I'm amazed at at, at just how fickle I am that way. How I'm so prone to go astray. You ever feel that way? How just I, even though in my heart I want to walk after the things of the Lord, but I've got this adulterous spirit in me. That what I want to do, that's not what I end up doing. I end up doing things I don't want. I just, I'm torn. And I find this adulterous spirit working in me. My ego coming out and trying to elevate myself. My pride coming out and trying to impress others. My selfishness coming out and not thinking about others and just thinking about what I want. My lust coming out and drawing me away from the things that I know are the best for me. Drawing me into things that I know are only going to destroy. And so we're these unfaithful lovers with the Holy Spirit then dwelling in us jealously calling us to love Jesus above above all else, calling us to himself. And here's what I want, want us to see. In spite of our adulteries, in spite of our wandering off, Jesus is a faithful lover to us. We are unfaithful lovers to Jesus, but Jesus is a faithful lover to us. Jesus is faithful to us. He gives us more grace. Verse 6 says, when we fall, he is patient, he is kind, he is abounding in mercy. And all through scripture, we are told over and over and over again of his amazing favor and grace towards us. And I am so thankful for it. I love the scripture that James took us into in that time of worship. Because what did it show? It just shows God's faithfulness to us. He is so faithful to us, even when we are unfaithful to him. And look at this psalm. Read it for me on your screen. Psalm 145. Let me hear you read this out loud. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. Isn't that incredible? Look what it says. He's full of compassion. 
As a father, I have been a father now for 27 years. Four kids. And as a father, I am learning more about God's love for me by being a father than probably anything I've ever done in my life except study the Word of God. Uh, Why? Because even when your kids mess up, even when your kids go off track, there is a parental love that is stronger than any love that is human. It's a divine given love, I believe, that all you want is, is you want your kids to get back on track. And you don't care how badly they mess up. You just want them to get back on track. And look what it says. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion. The scripture says, as a father pities his children, so God pities us. And he's full of compassion. He's not quick to get angry with us. I know we think he is. He's not. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in mercy. And he's just so tender to all of us. God delivered Israel out of Egypt by a mighty hand, as a good father. Israel had fallen away from God, and they had found themselves in slavery, in the bondage of sin. Egypt, a picture of the world, a picture of sin. And they had found themselves in bondage to sin. And God delivers them from Egypt by a mighty hand. Ten incredible plagues brought on Egypt, the last one being Passover, a picture of Jesus Christ. And God delivers his people by a mighty hand. He then takes them to the Red Sea, out of the Egypt, and they come up to the Red Sea, and the Egyptian armies come in behind. And what do God's people do? Complain against God. Did you bring us out here to kill us? God is slow to anger, abounding in mercy. What does he do? He opens up the Red Sea. They pass through. Wow, God's amazing. Moses writes a song. Miriam writes a song. Everybody's American Idol. Right? Everybody's happy. We were just delivered. Three days. Three days. What, did God bring us out here to kill us? God is full of compassion, slow to anger. He doesn't get mad at them. He gives them water. He understands they're thirsty. And then what does God do? He gives them some instruction on how to live their lives so that they're not blown all over every time something goes wrong thinking that he starts giving them instruction and teaching them as a, as a good father. Giving them instruction so that they might look different than the rest of the world. That they might not get lost. That they might be able to endure some hardship. And as God is giving them this instruction, giving Moses the Ten Commandments, guess what they're doing? They make a golden calf. They call it Yahweh. A golden calf. They call it God. And they have a giant orgy. And to the golden calf, they say, this is Yahweh that delivered us from Israel. I mean, from Egypt. Amazing. And Moses, looking to God, going, what do we do now? God, your people, incredibly unfaithful. What are you going to do, God? God says, Moses, come back up the mountain. Moses goes up the mountain trembling. Oh my gosh, what is God going to do? Is he going to divorce us? Is he going to kill us all? What is God going to do? We've blown it so bad. Trembling, Moses goes up the mountain. And there, I want you to show you what God says to Moses. Exodus 34 on your screens. This is what Moses speaks to his orgy-laden golden calf people who are calling this golden calf orgy God. This is what he says to them. Read it with me. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh the Lord full of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Let's just stop there a minute. How many of you would be surprised by God's answer at that time? Yeah, if your hand's not up, you're not thinking. Right? What? Are you kidding me? This is who God chooses 
to reveal what he chooses to say, how he chooses to reveal himself to this people that have been so adulterous? Are you kidding me? Let's go on, the verse says. I lavish, read with me, I lavish unfailing love and mercy to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But I do not excuse the guilty. Yeah, what does God choose to show? He chooses to show at a time when Moses was afraid they were all going to be zapped dead, at a time when Moses was going to fra- afraid that God was going to say, hey, I divorce these people. God says, I am full of compassion, mercy, and grace. And you're still my people. But know this. Look at the very last words he gives. But I do not excuse the guilty. Don't just think I wink at, wink at sin. Don't just think that everything's okay. No, 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 no. If you don't repent, you will pay for your sin. You will be separated from me. I am calling you with jealous, jealousy, just drawing you to myself. But don't think that I just wink at everything. I don't. And so here we see how faithful he is. Look what God does. Look how he blesses. Look at how he, he just pours out incredible grace on his people. Imagine how hard it would be to love an adulterous spouse. To be a faithful husband, providing and doing your best to care and lead and, and bless and your spouse, and then to have your wife go a whoring on you. Or the other way around. Imagine how hard that would be. And yet God chooses to love us that way. He's faithful even when we're faithless. It's his nature. And I am blown away at that. Jesus is so good for us that it's hard to believe that he could really love us that much. Jesus is so faithful that it seems too good to be true. And that's one of the problems with our faith. It just seems too good to be true. Who would love me after I failed like that? Who would love me like that? Who would love me when I've been so unfaithful? I have never been loved like that by any human that I've ever known. I've never experienced that kind of love, even from my parents. Never experienced that kind of love. There were always conditions that were like... Never experienced that kind of uncaused love. Furthermore, I've never loved anything like that. So that kind of faithful love to me, when I am unfaithful, is foreign to me. It's hard for me to actually understand. It's hard for us to actually believe. Yet Jesus loves us that way. Even when we are unfaithful to him, he still loves us. Someone say amen to that. Look at this verse in 2 Timothy where Paul tries to explain this to us. Read this with me. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. I'm going to pause there. Died with him? Yeah. Been associated with him in his death. I got baptized to die with him. That I might die to my flesh and live with him. He says if we do that, here's what's going to happen. We're going to live with him. Let's go on. Let's read the next stanza. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Wow. Different different thing. Yeah, if you associate with Jesus at his death and resurrection, you're going to live eternally. New subject. If you endure hardship and live for Jesus Christ, if you are a builder of his kingdom, if you are serving him, you know what's going to happen? You're not only going to live with him eternally, you're going to do what? You're going to reign. You're going to be given great rewards. You're going to be given authority in the kingdom to come. Not everyone resurrects equally. Some resurrect with a greater resurrection than others. There are greater rewards in heaven. And here's what he says. If we endure, we're going to reign with him. Next stanza, read it with me. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Yeah, he won't force us forever. If we refuse to be in a relationship with him, okay, I won't make you. But Look at the next stanza, look at this. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. 
when his people went a whoring and did a golden calf, he remained what? Faithful. Because he cannot deny himself. It's who he is. It's who he is. I'm not going to be faithless, faithless to you just because you're faithless to me. I'll hold you up. I'll bring you back. I'll restore you. It's who he is. And to Moses, he said, listen, Moses, I want you to know, yeah, I know everybody messed up. Yeah, I know it was bad. Yeah, I know it was really ugly. Here's the deal. I'm gracious, I'm merciful, and I'm forgiving. And that's who he chose to reveal himself to Moses after they had just committed the most atrocious of sins. And you know what happened when that happened? Moses' heart soared. Oh, my goodness. Lord, you're amazing. The depth of understanding of Moses' knowledge of God's love for him just went up exponentially. And you know what happened as a result? Moses loved God all the more than he had ever loved God before. And Moses loved God's people more than he had ever loved God's people before. And Moses had more compassion than Moses had ever had before. And Moses became more gracious than he had ever been before. And Moses became more humble than he had ever been before. And Moses was being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. How? By seeing God's faithful love to him, Moses became more like God. And that's the work that God is trying to do in our lives, that we would be more like his son Jesus, that we would be more moved by love, that we would care more for God and care more for God's people and understand who he is, that we would be more bold. Actually, Moses got a lot more bold when he heard God say, faithful and long-suffering and patient and and all these things. You know what Moses then said? God, I want to see you. I want to know more of you. I got to see more of you, Lord. And look at this next verse. Look what happened next in this same passage. Look what Moses said. Read it out loud with me. Moses immediately threw himself to the ground and worshiped. Let's stop there. Think about it. He just said, oh my gosh. I came up here expecting to get a divorce. I came up here expecting to get a spanking. I came up here expecting maybe you were going to kill me. And instead you bathed me with love. Lord, I worship you. And look what he says. Oh, Lord, if it is true that I have found favor with you, then please go among us. Yep, we're a stubborn and a rebellious people, but please forgive our iniquity and our sins and claim us as your own special possession. Wow. Wow. Lord, claim us as your own special possession. You know what you are to God? You know what you are to God? You are his own special possession. He created you that you might know how great his love for you is and that you would respond with awe and wonder and be transformed by not your greatness, by his greatness, by his love. So he says, Lord, I want to see you. I want to experience you. This verse goes on. Look what happened. The Lord replied, listen, I am making a covenant with you in the presence of all your people. I will perform miracles that have never been performed anywhere in any nation or in all of the earth. What's he saying? Yeah, I'm pouring my grace, my mercy my love upon you. Why? So that I might use you and do works in your life, heal your marriage, heal your family, heal your life, heal your ego, get rid of these bad qualities in your life, transform you completely, do the most miraculous work in you so that all the nations of the earth will go, wow, look what happens for those people who are in relationship with God. Let's go on what the verse says. And all the people around you will see the power and the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with who? You. With you. With you. Wow. Does that move you? 
Are you moved right now? Or, or, or are you thinking about the ninth hole, maybe putting in the putter in the... See what happens? The Holy Spirit yearns jealously. Where are you at right now? Oh, I hope you hear the message that God would speak to us. So incredible that he loves us like that. And like Moses, when we understand God's love, when we understand God's faithfulness to us, we become transformed. No longer childishly thinking that God is going to mete out rewards and punishments for our behavior. Oh, I blew it. He's going to punish me. Oh, I've been a good boy. Better bless me, God. Childish thinking. Childish thinking. It's a creepy guy who takes a girl out and thinks, now you got to sleep with me. It's a creep. That's not love. And it is childish thinking when we think that God exists to mete out rewards and punishment for our behavior. It's not who he is. Not who he is. And Moses now understanding that now becomes empowered to live for God and be transformed. We become overwhelmed with gratitude when we understand his love for us and it changes us. Somehow this sovereign, infinite God would take interest in me so much so that he would even give his son on the cross to bring me back into fellowship. Even when I'm wandering off and going a whoring, he would say, no, I want you back. I know you don't know what I'm doing. I'm preparing everything for you. I'm trying to bring you back and I will eventually woo you. Will you listen? And when we understand, when we grasp it, it changes us from the inside out. And the Bible says, hey, when that happens, what can separate us from the love of God? What can separate us? Hardship, sickness, bankruptcy, peril, sword. Nothing can separate us from the love of God once we understand his love. Nothing. And that's what he's trying to do in all of our lives right now. What are you trusting in? What are you relying on? How are you viewing God? Do you understand how faithful he is and what he wants to do in your life? He wants to give us his unmerited favor all the time that we might be transformed. May I remind you, Jesus regularly and repeatedly forgave prostitutes, criminals, swindlers, corrupt businessmen, tax collectors that would take more for themselves than they took for the government. Businessmen who just did shady deals. Forgive, 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 forgive. Sexually immoral, forgiven. Drug addicts, alcoholics, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. There was no uh, limit to the amount of forgiveness Jesus would give sinners. He even forgave those who were crucifying him. I always marvel at Malchus. You remember Malchus? Who was Malchus? Malchus was a soldier of the high priest. You know what the name Malchus means? He is my king. And Malchus comes to arrest Jesus. And Peter chops off his ear. And what does Jesus do? He heals the guy who's coming to arrest him to crucify him. The hypocrite who says, he is my king, who's coming to arrest the king. There's no limit to his forgiveness. It's staggering. It's mind-boggling. And therefore, James tells us, draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. What an incredible promise. Let me paraphrase it. Seek, Seek intimacy with God, and God will give intimacy to you. Incredible. When I was a junior in high school, I was smitten by a high school cheerleader. She was stunningly gorgeous. Her name was Michelle. She was a senior. Super popular. I was a junior. We started hanging out a bit, and I was enamored. Problem? Michelle, she was out of my league. And I asked Michelle out, and you know what happened? She said, no, let's just be friends. What happened? 
Oh, I want to grow in my relationship with you. I want more intimacy. Problem? No, 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 no. You're not cool enough. You're not hip enough. You're not handsome enough. You're not close to my league. Not a chance. (laughs) And so I had to worship from afar. And by God's grace, he knew what he was doing in my life. I'm so thankful that I got a good and perfect gift that came from above, my wife Lisa. But as a foolish boy, oh, my heart was broken. Why? Because, oh, I wanted to come. I wanted, and it was like, no, 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 not possible, not possible. God is so far out of our league. God is so far out of our league. Michelle was out of my league because I was a senior. Excuse me, she was a senior, I was a junior. She was gorgeous, I was ugly. She was, she was so far out of my league that it made it impossible. But I tell you, as far as Michelle was out of my league, God is infinitely further out of my league. Infinitely further. And here's what God says. Draw close to me and I will draw close to you. I tell you what, that is incredible. That is incredible. And all through Scripture, that's what Jesus did. That's what we heard. Old Testament, New Testament, it's all the same. This constant message from God, come to me. Jesus said it this way, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll bless you. Over and over, Isaiah 55, ho, come, all who thirst, come and receive, come and buy. Milk without price, the finest affairs, the most amazing meal. Come and receive, I'll give it to you. Abundant mercies of David, I'll just bless you. Everyone who thirsts, come and buy. Psalm 145, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in spirit and in truth. Over and over in scripture, Hebrews 11, he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him just seek him he will reward you over and over that's what we get in scripture jesus said he who comes to me i will in no way cast out draw near to me i'll draw near to you over and over and over we see this message in scripture god saying i'm way out of your league but it doesn't matter come to me and i will be intimate with you how incredible how incredible revelation 22 on your screen Let me hear you read this. And the Spirit said to the bride, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him come. Take of the water of life freely. What is God saying? Saying, listen, the Holy Spirit has one message. Come to Jesus Christ. And the bride, once she is led by the Holy Spirit, has one message. Come to Jesus Christ. And whoever is thirsty, come to Jesus Christ. This is God's message. Draw near to me. I will reveal myself to you. This is why I made you, God says. Isn't that great? And I want you to know, if you are even thinking about drawing near to God, it's because God is calling you by name. God is calling you by name. Jesus said it this way, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. We cannot come to God unless he gives us access. And if you are even thinking about coming to God, it's because God is calling you to himself. And I want to just give you a stern warning this morning. Do not put him off. Do not put him off. My spirit will not always strive with man, God said back in Genesis 6. Do not put him off. Seek the Lord, wait while he may be found. Call upon him when he is near. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. Do not put him off. He is to be feared. He is a great judge. He is the... He is the one who loves you enough to give you what you want. And if we spurn him and spurn him and spurn him and we say, no, I don't want a relationship, I don't want a relationship, I don't want a relationship, 
you will enter into eternity separated from God. Separated from love. And the Bible says it is weeping, it is gnashing of teeth, it is backbiting, it is backstabbing, it is cruel, it is no place for you, no place for man, it was created for Satan. And so we need to stand in fear, we need to stand in awe and realize how gracious God is and now realize that he's calling us for a reason that we might draw near to him. I want to close, I want to give you, in the last ten minutes, I want to give you Three ways that we can draw near to God. Three ways to draw near to God. How do we draw near to God? James tells us. He tells us. Look what he says first. Verse 7. James 4, verse 7. Read it with me. Therefore, what does it say? Three words. Submit to God. What does that mean? Submit to God's authority. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are no longer to decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. We're to submit to God's authority. No longer doing what is right in our own eyes. Instead, aligning our will to God's will. Having a reverence for God's authority. When God made man, when he made Adam, he gave them one instruction. Actually, two instructions. I take that back. One instruction, enjoy life. Fill the world, rule over it, multiply, have intimacy with your wife, produce children, rule the world, have dominion over it. That was one command. The other command, what was the other command? Do not decide for yourself what is right and what is wrong. Do not decide for yourself what is right and what is wrong. The day you do that, you'll be separated from me. The day you do that, death will come upon you. The day you do that, your life will fall apart. Do not decide for yourself what is right or wrong. Don't partake of the knowledge of what is good and what is evil. Let me decide what is good and let me decide what is evil and just listen to me. And so... Submitting to God's authority means that we no longer decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. We see ourselves as servants of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to submit to his authority. Lord, I'm your servant. I want to serve you. I want to walk in your ways. Your ways are amazing. I want to walk in them. We're members of his kingdom. We understand that he has a purpose on our life. We call this church the mission church that we might all embrace this mission that God is calling us to. God has a personal calling on your life. I was talking with my daughter last night in the hospital room. That was, we were visiting my mom, just her and I. And she goes, God's calling on my life just seems like so far off. It seems like so romanticized. seems like, how do I know it? And I said, oh, man, baby, it's real. Now walk in this calling that God has on your life. Walk in it. How do I do it? By submitting to his authority. Let him decide what is right and what is wrong. Let him direct your path. You are to be on a mission. You are to be telling people about Jesus Christ, are you? You are to be walking in his ways, are you? You are to be bringing others to Jesus, are you? You said, no, I can't do that. I mean, I'd be embarrassed. What would I say? Do you want to go to summer nights with me? It's not that hard. As you're talking to somebody at work and they're sharing their hardships with you, what do I say? Hey, can I pray for you? It's not that hard. Hey, you want to come to mission group with me? Hey, you want to come to church with me? It's not that hard. Submit to God's authority. Walk in his ways. Walk in his ways. Submitting to God's authority means we, we, we do what God tells us to do. It means that we love God more than we love money. It means that we put Jesus first in our finances. It means that men are the spiritual leaders in their homes. Showing their wives, their family, their church, their community what it means to put your family's needs above your own. Submitting to God means teaching your sons and your daughters the lordship of Jesus Christ. Submitting to God means that we're raising them in the admonition of the Lord, our kids, our families. Teaching them that love is, a, is an action. Love is as love does. Love isn't a feeling. 
We're teaching them the ways of the Lord. We're teaching them to respect authority, that character matters, to take responsibility for your own actions, to bring things back better than you borrow them, to realize that life isn't fair. Don't give into it. Rise above it. To realize that, that there are moral absolutes. Some things are black and white. There's not moral relativism that we have to learn God's way. Yeah, that's what it means to submit to God's authority. To walk in his path. Submitting to God's authority means our ideas about sexual behavior are brought into obedience of Jesus Christ. Submitting to God's authority means that we're modest in the way we dress. I walk through the, the halls at the forum here in town, and I'm just amazed at the way women are dressing. Submitting to authority means that we listen to what God says. You go to the beach, it's amazing. How far we have gotten from God's ways. There are more, it's ridiculous. I won't even just, you know. Submitting to God's authority means that we understand that sex is a gift for God, for a husband and a wife, not to be flaunted in the world. That we reserve our passions for each other and each other alone. It's a gift from God. It's used the right way. That we wait until marriage, until we experience that gift. I'm so proud of the young adults in this church, man. The last seven marriages we've done have been virgins to the altar, to the glory of God. That's what submitting to God means. It means standing up for what is right. I read this week in Ontario, genderless birth certificates. Crazy. We've lost our minds. I can imagine what that's like. Moms in labor, doctors in the room. It's a it's a it. It's not a boy, it's not a girl, it's an it. We'll tell you in 20 years what it is. Craziness. Submitting to God means obeying God. It means putting his will over our will. It means Dis disciplining ourselves to obey God because he is God. His ways work. When we walk in them, we're, we're going to be blessed. Look what else he says. Number two, submitting to God means that we resist the devil. We resist the devil. I want you to know Satan has two primary tactics that he uses. They're very effective. Two primary tactics. Do you know what they are? Number one, to deceive. Number two, to condemn. And we have to resist both of those. To deceive and to condemn. He loves to deceive us. You don't need to submit to God. You don't need to submit to anyone. Do whatever you want. Follow your heart. Just follow your heart. We think that's a good thing. Not a good thing. Why? Because my heart is deceptive. We don't follow our heart. We follow God's will. Do what's right. Just do what you think is right. Whatever is good for you. There are no absolutes. Just serve yourself. And it sounds good to us. And so we cheat on a test when we need to cheat on a test. Because it helps me out. We lie when we want to lie. Because it helps me out. And we're told by the world, choose your own morality. Do sex your way. It's your body. Do whatever you want with your body. It's your body. Act like you want to. Buy what you want to. Do what you want to. And you know what happens? It works for a little while. It's real attractive. It's, it seems like it's going to be fun. But you know what happens? Life begins to unravel. And we get empty. We get lonely. We get broken. And Satan then moves into his second nature. He then starts to, after he's deceived us, he starts to condemn us. You're not a good person. I can't believe what you did. You're so bad. You're so messed up. And he begins to condemn us. You're a loser. You're worthless. You put on a front, but you're a failure. You're unlovable. You're not good enough. God's not for you. You don't deserve God's love. You don't deserve. And that's what he does. He's the accuser of the brethren night and day. And James says, hey, I want you to resist it. I want you to resist his temptation. And I want you to resist his condemnation. Resist him. That's what it means to resist him. Run to the truth, not to the deception. 
James says, hey, when you're facing temptation, remember this. It's not a good gift. I know it looks amazing. It's not a good gift. When that girl's immorally dressed, guys, and she goes walking down the beach in her cheeky little bathing suit, remember this. It's not a good gift. I know it looks amazing. It's not a good gift. Well, how do you know? Here's how you know. Because every good and perfect gift is from above. And comes down from the Father of lights, the one who created the sun, the moon, the stars, with whom is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth that we might be the first fruits of his creation, that we might be those who walk and talk with God in the cool of the day. We avoid his deception, we avoid his condemnation. The last thing we do is we plead to Jesus for a pure heart. Look what he says in verse 8. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts, double-minded. In other words, acknowledge that, hey, the, I've got this torn issue here. I love things that aren't good for me. Just acknowledge that and ask God to purify your heart. Look what he says, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to joy. Excuse me, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy turn to gloom. Hey, God's not a downer. He's not saying walk around with a sad face. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, realize the things that I'm calling you to are good. And the things that your flesh are desiring, the partying and the, are not good. And, and mourn those things. We get a perfect example of this in Luke chapter 5 with Peter. Peter was very early in his relationship with Jesus Christ. He had heard Jesus teach a few times and he was in awe. But he's still a fisherman. He's still doing his own life. And one day Peter had been fishing and uh, hadn't caught anything and brought the nets in and Peter's there washing off the nets. The day's done and Jesus says, hey, can I borrow your boat? Is that the Sea of Galilee? Can I borrow your boat? Peter says, sure. James, excuse me, Jesus gets in the boat, goes off just a little ways out into the ocean, and from there preaches a sermon because the multitudes had started gathering. And he gets away in the little boat and preaches a sermon to the multitudes. And he comes back in, brings the boat back in, and he wants to give Peter a reimbursement for the boat rental. And he doesn't have any money. So he tells Peter, Peter, get your nets, get back in the boat. Put your nets in the water. Peter goes, hey, are you kidding me? We've been fishing all day, haven't caught nothing. Peter, put your nets in the water. Tells him plural, nets. Put your nets in the water. Peter reluctantly gives him a smart aleck, all right, whatever. And he goes and he does it. He puts one net in the water. So many fish in that net, that net begins to break. Told you, you should have used more nets, Peter. He comes back in. You know what Peter says? Peter says, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. What happened? Peter got a glimpse of God's holiness. Peter got a glimpse of God's sovereignty and his laughter, his pride, prideful, arrogant heart that says, hey, I've been fishing all day. I know better than you, was humbled. And his laughter was turned to mourning. That's what James is teaching us. That's what James is teaching us. And he says, hey, plead with God for a pure heart. Why? Because at times we're double-minded. With one eye we love Jesus. With one eye we love lust. With one foot we walk towards Jesus. With one foot we walk towards sin. With one mind we think, oh, God's amazing. With another mind I think I'm amazing. And he says, hey, plead with Jesus for a pure heart. We must be honest about our duplicity and plead with Jesus for a pure heart. That's what David did in Psalm 51. We read it this morning in our leaders' meeting. This is what David did. He said, oh, Lord, I realized I've wanted the wrong things. Now, create in me a pure heart and draw me back into your presence. Bring me back into fellowship with you that I might experience your spirit. These are God's instructions to us. These are his ways. This is how we draw near to God. We submit to his authority. We resist the deception and the condemnation of the devil. 
And we ask God for a pure heart over and over and over again because my heart's corrupt. Stand with me.